Good morning. It's Baptism Sunday. Yes. Very, very excited about this. We are continuing this series as Malik, Laura, and Mike read. And this series is known as In the Beginning, Jesus. We have been walking through the book of Genesis, the first book of our scriptures, the first book in the Hebrew scriptures. And even though other faiths and religions will subscribe possibly to Genesis as a history book, a Christian is one who follows Christ. And we see Christ foreshadowed and veiled and talked about throughout the book of Genesis. And so when we come to a passage that has historical reference, like we are in today, regarding a bloodline that ultimately will be the exact bloodline that Jesus Christ comes from and through, we tend to think that that is all that this chapter or this passage has to offer in the realm of Jesus being connected to it. In my best Morpheus voice... What if I told you that Jesus is in all of the Bible? And what if I told you that God, in his infinite wisdom, decides to take the physical happenings of the Old Testament and make them spiritual realities in our lives today? Hmm, what if I told you that? So as we read this chapter about a father sending a servant to go find his son a wife, you might automatically think, well, that's not similar to us today. We don't have a culture that has servants or arranged marriages. No, we have employees, and we have Bumble and Tinder, right? And what we will see today in a nutshell is Abraham telling his servant to go and find a wife for his son, Isaac. And he has him swear an oath, symbolized by placing his hand underneath his thigh, awkward. He has him swear that he will not find Isaac a wife from the Canaanites, in which was the land that Abraham and his family were currently living in at the time. He's unable to make the journey himself. He old. And Abraham sends his nameless servant, even though he's got a name, but it's not named in this chapter, sends his nameless servant to go searching for a wife for Isaac from Abraham's relatives. And as we will read, as you've already heard read, the servant will find Isaac a wife, technically a second cousin, to be specific, through a circumstance of prayer and petition. But the passage we read today is setting up a New Testament reality that was invisible to those who were yet to experience it. Let's be real. As they were reading this passage, you were going, what? Right? Can we be, can we be honest? Let me point out an imagery that perhaps we haven't thought about when seeing this informational and historical chapter of Scripture with the physical happenings that are going to point to spiritual realities. God sends his servants to invite people to be the bride of his son. See where I'm going with this? So the imagery goes something like this. God is symbolized by Abraham. The servant is symbolized by Jesus' followers, Christians. Isaac symbolizes the son. And as we will see, Rebekah symbolizes those that God would call to himself to be his church, to be the bride of Christ. Y'all with me? Y'all have the decoder ring on? All right, let's read. Verse 1. Abraham was now very old. See, I didn't make that up. And the Lord had blessed him in every way. Abraham had led a faith-filled life, not always making the right choices, but sometimes, sometimes showing glimpses of immediate obedience. And God, who is truly the faithful one in the relationship, by the way, that's my takeaway, God, who is truly the faithful one in the relationship with Abraham, had blessed Abraham like he said that he would. Much of Genesis in the past many chapters, as we've studied lately and studied years ago, has focused on Abraham. But the writer, Moses, is now pivoting, pivot, to Abraham's legacy. In this case, in Isaac. And the woman that he will marry and will bear his children, Rebekah. And any and all of us who have believed unto the Lord Jesus Christ have done so because God, in his glorious grace, decided to send us an invitation that we ultimately understood and received through faith. And when we believe, we are included 
in what is known as the bride of Christ. We are adopted into God's family, and we collectively become the church because the church ain't the steeple, it's the people, right? And in which we often reference throughout Scripture, the church is the bride of Christ. Paul, the apostle, puts it this way when pointing out biblical marriage in Ephesians 5. He says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And what was it that made her, the church, blameless and spotless in God's sight? The washing of the word. The word of God being washed over. Being in the word of God. Obeying the word of God. Not doing good stuff. Or or trying really hard not to do bad things. But the word of God washed over her, the church. You and me, if we've believed unto the Lord. Knowing the truth of the gospel the redemptive work of Christ, and allowing that truth to interpret the rest of the Bible for us, the rest of the word, which points to a perfect Savior and a perfect Lord, not a bunch of do-gooders trying really hard not to sin. But how does one come to know Christ and become part of his bride? I think the story gives a really great example of how that takes place. So we're going to read for a bit. Here we go. Verse 2. He said, Abraham said to the senior servant in his household, the one in charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I am living, but will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. The servant asked him, what if the woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Shall I then take your son back to the country you came from? Shall I make your son look better? Shall I take him so she'd know what she'd be getting? Sorry, that's just what I'm focusing on. Verse 6, make sure that you do not take my son back there, Abraham said. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household and my native land, and who spoke to me and promised me an oath, saying, to your offspring, I will give this land. And he will send his angel before you so that you can get a wife for my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to come back with you, then you will be released from this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. Verse 10, then the servant left, taking with him 10 of his master's camels, loaded with all kinds of good things from his master. He set out for Aram, Neheram, I I said that without confidence, and made his way to the town of Nahor. He had the camels kneel down near the well outside the town. It was toward evening, the time the women go out to draw water. Then he prayed, Lord God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside the spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be. That when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, drink, and I will water your camels too. And let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this, I will know that you've shown kindness to my master. This short passage that we just read, I think points to the expectation. The expectation. The expectation of God is that there are some who will believe. The reality is a lot of us are a little afraid to talk about our faith, but the reality is there are people all around us who will believe. Some who will trust, some who will receive this invitation to be the son's bride. The expectation for the servant, remember, that's those of us who have already received this invitation of grace, is to go. It's to go and attempt to find those who would then receive the invitation. And they expect God to do the work through them. The results are not up to us, church. But the willingness and faith to believe that God can work through us if we are willing, that is what is expected of us. Often we hear this word evangelism, and some of you kind of, and we're afraid, or we're jaded. Because we're afraid of how others might respond to our beliefs, 
or we're jaded because we have seen those who treat inviting people to know Jesus as turn or burn, or as I've seen on many overpasses lately, Jesus or hell. And so who wants to identify with those idiots, right? I don't, but I do want others to know who I know because Jesus, he's legiticus, okay? Jesus is legit. Jesus speaking about the kingdom of God to his disciples would often speak in parables and what it was like to actually receive this invitation from God. In Matthew 13, 45 and 46, Jesus says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had, and he bought it. This is someone who understands the invitation that Jesus is speaking about. This is someone who sees Jesus for who he is. This invite is so compelling, so irresistible to them that selling all that you have does not seem all that unreasonable. And yet this isn't about money. We're not about to pass a bag. This is about priority. When the invitation is received, priorities change. Let me say that again. When the invitation is received, your priorities change, and they're changing. Because the master of your universe is no longer yourself, but instead the one who paid for your sin. So you have the expectation of the father. You have the expectation of the servant. There's also going to be an expectation of the bride. Not that they would necessarily act a certain way or do a certain thing like water the camels, but that the one who truly understands the invitation would receive it with joy and would feel no reservations to repent and turn to God and his word as truth because they understand the beauty of the gracious offer. Look at how Jesus points out the inclusivity. I can't say that word. How inclusive Jesus is through the invitation. Here we go. Verse 16 of Luke 14. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. All of you hosts right now are starting to get frustrated. The first said, I've just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen. I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry, and he ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has already been done, but there's still room. Then the master told the servant, go out into the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who are invited will get a taste of my banquet. The parable reads kind of like an angry master, especially in how it concludes. But I actually think this is rather a beautiful and gracious example of a master of the banquet who wants people to share in his grace with him, to share in his joy, to come and party. But rather many who have had this invitation have chosen to reject it. They have excuses. They have priorities that stand above God and his invitation. I've never enjoyed an invitation being one that seems to be guilted with hell rather than God's love for his creation. But if I'm being honest, I've also seen far too much of what people claim as Christianity as essentially just a get out of hell free card rather than a marriage to Jesus who calls us to himself and loves and serves his bride. Aaron and I, just celebrated 21 years of marriage last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it actually doesn't feel like it was last week. It feels like it was so much longer. But 21 years is awesome. And it's so fun. And while that number can kind of be shocking, considering she's only 24, uh, marriage is such a sanctifying and important relationship. It's full of outdoing one another in honor. 
It's full of laying down our lives for one another because Christ first laid down his life for us. That's a biblical marriage. But imagine when I proposed, and I'm not going to tell you the story, it's lame, but imagine when I proposed, I was like, Aaron, will you marry me? And she's like, I guess. I have nothing else to do. (laughs) That's honestly how some people treat the invitation from Christ. When they really just don't want to go to hell. I guess so. I don't really like the hot, so I guess I'll believe in Jesus when it's convenient for me. Which honestly is not what happens when the Holy Spirit has indwelled a believer. Imagine the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, the Spirit of God, the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, who was the power that Jesus promised his disciples when he told them to go be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Imagine that the Spirit of God just made us believe in Jesus when we felt like it. So the disciples are at Pentecost. The Spirit of God is manifesting himself with tongues of fire in Acts 2. And thousands of God-fearing Jews and other nationalities are there. And what do they hear in their own languages? Believe in Jesus when it's convenient. And you won't go to hell, okay? No. That isn't what the Holy Spirit did. Peter, who was filled with the Spirit, he got up, he unpacked the Holy Scriptures, the Old Testament, and he pointed to the one who lived, the one who died, the one who rose from the dead, and thousands of men and women were cut to the heart, and they asked, according to Acts 2, verse 38, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So you want to know the expectation for those that God is calling to himself, inviting into his family to be part of his bride? It's to believe, to truly believe, and that belief, that biblical belief calls you to follow calls you to identify with Christ and his finished work as your sole means of right standing before God. Today, we're going to see a a baptisms. S, I'll tell you more about that in a moment. But one of the baptisms is of a young man who I consider a friend. His name's Joel. He's been attending here for many months now. And the Lord Jesus Christ has gotten a hold of this man through his word. And I believe through belief in that word, he has been entrusted and indwelled the Holy Spirit. Know why I think that? Not because he's perfect, not because he's polished, but because he's pursuing Christ in his word. And the questions that he asks, the conclusions that he comes to, and the care he has for Jesus and knowing what the text actually means, I believe that requires the Holy Spirit. That is a work of God drawing this young man, I'm older than him, so I can say that, drawing this young man to himself, taking him from spiritual death to spiritual life. And we all get to witness the symbol of that today when he is baptized. So after the expectation, I think God begins to give confirmation of the one that he's drawing. Verse 15, before the servant had finished praying, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. The woman was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever slept with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. The servant hurried to meet her and said, Please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her her hands and gave him a drink. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too until they have had enough to drink. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water, and drew enough for all his camels. Without saying a word, the man watched her closely to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. Now again, I spoke about this two weeks ago. The narrative in the Old Testament often is descriptive. It's not prescriptive. You know what? Prescription, like, hey, I need to go to the doctor and he prescribed this medicine for me. This is descriptive of what happened. Don't marry your cousin. All right, let's start there. This is descriptive. 
Single people, if you're looking for a spouse, don't fleece God with what you think they should be. Well, he should have green eyes and snort when he laughs. That's the one for me. Don't do that. No, this is not prescriptive, meaning this is what we all should do. Rather, this passage is descriptive of what actually happened. And I think it's recorded because the physical happening revealed an even clearer reality. When God is drawing someone there is confirmation. There is some type of action and direction and even change that takes place when someone is being drawn by God to his family. What I've experienced over two decades in ministry is that God gives a sense of gospel awareness to those that he draws. So today, Joel's going to be baptized and our very own Becca is going to be baptized. Yeah. And Becca, who I've known since she was a f- sophomore in high school? Freshman in high school? Yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, that was a minute. Uh, she, as I've gotten to know her, I've seen a woman over time, and especially as of late, have gospel awareness, have what does God's word say, care about the realities of the truth of the word, and point me and others who love her back to Christ. They begin to see things, those who are being drawn by God, begin to see things through the lens of the redemptive message of Christ. Not necessarily become theologians, but the main thing, that God in his grace decided to offer right standing before him to sinful people like us through the work of his son received by faith as our only means of justification before God. Yeah, that becomes a priority. That becomes an emphasis far more than attempting to look the part or be really religious. And so this confirmation is more than just wanting to attend a church service, but rather be part of a community. It's more than just wanting to read the Bible, but to want to know more about the God of the Bible. It's not just I don't want to sin anymore, but rather I see God's goodness all the time, and it's something that I can emulate through the work of his spirit in me, and I want to show others that. So these changes become confirmation that God is drawing, that he is wooing us to himself. But I think far too often we're satisfied with external things that we just assume are eternal workings of God, when they might just be people trying really hard to look like they're being changed. I'm going to leave it at that. Now, as we begin verse 22, I think that what we're about to see is the preparation that God uses to draw to himself. Verse 22, when the camels had finished drinking, the man took out a nose ring weighing a becca (laughs) and two gold bracelets weighing 10 shekels. Then he asked, whose daughter are you? Please tell me, is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She answered, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of that Milcah bore to Nahor. And she added, we have plenty of straw and fodder. (laughs) I'm going to use fodder this week somehow. As well as a room for you to spend the night. Rebecca was gifted by Abraham's servant, both a nose ring and two bracelets that were of great worth. They were of great weight, not as a wedding gift. We're not there yet, but instead as a thank you for her kindness for the water. And then he asks a more personal question about her lineage and who is her father. Which she replied as the daughter of Bethuel, if you remember in the conclusion of chapter 22, I was teaching that, Moses points out the family connection and Rebekah's relationship to Abraham through his brother Nahor. The servant then inquires if there was any place for him and his camels to stay with them. And Rebekah offers her father's house for him to stay. Let me just say that if you are a believer and you feel compelled to share Christ with someone, questions are one of the most useful tools when having a gospel conversation. Questions are your friends. Questions are a tool that you can use. And God, in this context, has been preparing this opportunity. Rebecca seems to be confirmed by God as the one who has been drawn to be the wife of the son. So through the expectation, through the confirmation, And now through the preparation, soon there will be an invitation. But instead of jumping into a cross illustration, let me grab my iPad and my pencil, or Roman's Road, or telling her that she's a sinner 
He doesn't even invite her to meet Isaac yet. But instead, he sets up a time to have a distraction-less conversation. I don't know about you, but often when I'm having a Christ-sharing conversation, a gospel conversation with someone, distractions and roadblocks are aplenty. Anywhere from phones going off to alarms on vehicles. And while I'm not going to blame the devil for the lack of peace when attempting to share Christ, I think the servant was very wise to have a more private conversation before the invitation to be Isaac's wife. Now we're going to skip a little bit. We're going to skip to verse 34 and we're going to see the presentation. And I'm going to read a lot similar to what Laura read. So it would be easy to check out. But remember where we're going. Abraham's servant will describe what has taken place to Rebekah's family. And Laban, her brother, will specifically ask, hey, so what happened? What took place? But look at this as we read it with gospel eyes. How is this similar to our own presentation when we share with others who are yet to know the love and grace of our Lord? Here's what it says in verse 34. So he said, Abraham, uh, Abraham's servant, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has blessed my master abundantly, and he has become wealthy. He has given him sheep and cattle, silver and gold and male and female servants and camels and donkeys. My master's wife, Sarah, has borne him a son in her old age and has given him everything he owns. My master made me swear an oath and said, you must not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live. But go to my father's family and to my own clan and get a wife for my son. Then I asked my master, what if the woman will not come back with me? He replied, the Lord before whom I have walked faithfully will send his angel with you and make your journey a success so that you can get a wife for my son from my own clan and from my father's family. You will be released from this oath if when you go to my clan, they refuse to give her to you. Then you will be released from my oath. When I came to the spring today, I said, Lord God of my master Abraham, if you will, please grant success to the journey on which I come. Verse 43, see, I'm standing beside the spring. If a young woman comes out to draw water and I say to her, please let me drink a little water from your jar. And if she says to me, drink and I'll draw water for your camels too, let her be the one the Lord has chosen for my master's son. Before I finished praying in my heart, Rebecca came out with her jaw on her shul- jar on her shoulder She went out to the spring and drew water and said to her, please give me a drink. She quickly lowered her jar from her shoulder and said, drink and I'll water your camels too. So I drank and she watered the camels also. I asked her, whose daughter are you? She said, the daughter of Bethuel, son of Nahor, whom Milcah bore to him. Then I put the ring in her nose and the bracelets on her arms and I bowed down and worshiped the Lord. I praised the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me on the right road to get the granddaughter of my master's brother for his son. Now, if you'll show me kindness and faithfulness to my master, tell me. And if not, tell me so I may, so I know which way to turn. Laban, Rebecca's brother, and Bethuel answered, This is from the Lord. We can say nothing to you one way or the other. Here is Rebecca. Take her and go and let her become the wife of your master's son as the Lord has directed. When Abraham's servant heard that they had said, he bowed down to the ground before the Lord. Then the servant brought out gold and silver and jewelry and articles of clothing and gave them to Rebecca. He also gave them costly gifts to her brother and to her mother. (laughs) Now listen, I read that, it was long, and every analogy breaks down. If this is a symbol of sharing Christ with someone, I can't convince someone's parents to then make their children believe, (laughs) no matter what some religions say. I can't convince... Anyone, it's really a work of God, but I can share and I can invite. But culturally, this is how it worked when a woman would be given from a family to another. But also in this moment, you will see that the invitation of Rebecca is actually the one to choose to receive it or reject it. But looking at the story through the gospel lens, the servant began with how wonderful his master was. And I'm struck by the fact that often when we share the gospel, we forget that simple fact. When we're in church, it's easy to sing praises to his name and clap. It's culturally acceptable to say amen. Are you familiar with this word? Okay. But often when we walk out these doors, we forget how faithful and glorious and mighty and wonderful and beautiful our God is. 
So the servant, after speaking highly of his master, he then shares his own testimony of what he knows to be true and he experienced firsthand. That's why I read it, just to remind you of it. Church, every believer in here who has believed unto the Lord Jesus Christ, you have a testimony of grace and God's work and him being in your life. Every single one of you. You're like, well, it's not, it's kind of boring. No, it's not. Your testimony of God intervening in your life is not boring. It's true. And it shows off how good he is. Heck, I know many of your testimonies. And if we were to share how good we think God is and then testify to what we really believe he has done, that is far more compelling than turn or burn or Jesus or hell. And the mission of this church, the bride of Christ, the church of the living God, is to make disciples. Not religious copycats. We're not into moral modification. I like how Ray Steadman said, now, before we put the quote, oh, no, no, put it, take it, take it back. Okay, take it, thank you. All right, before I read it, I want to let you know he said this in the 60s, so it's gonna sound like the 60s, okay? I'm just putting that out there. All right, different era. Here we go, let's read it. Our job is not to change people's habits. We're not out to get people to stop drinking, smoking, <laughs> dancing, <laughs> and going to the movies. <laughs> that isn't our concern. Our job is to win them to Christ. Amen, Ray. Not to make church members out of them. Hallelujah. Dancing and going to the movies. Big fan. Good thing I'm saved by grace. <laughs> the point is that the presentation is one of life change, but not in order to be saved. Rather, as a byproduct of your salvation is that we begin to pursue and over time and through grace and obedience, we begin to look more like Jesus. Not literally. Don't let the beard and the sandals fool you. My looking like Jesus has far more to do with over two decades of pursuit of Christ and him changing me from the inside out. Okay, we're going to land the plane. Get ready to come up. Get ready. Not yet. We have seen the expectation. We've seen the confirmation. We've seen the preparation and the proclamation. Now we're going to read the invitation. Verse 54. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night there. This is the servant. When they got up the next morning, he said, send me on my way to my master. But her brother, Laban, and her mother replied, let the young woman remain with us 10 days or so. Then you may go. But he said to them, do not detain me. Now that the Lord has granted success to my journey, send me on my way so I may go to my master. Then they said, let's call the young woman and ask her about it. So they called Rebecca and asked her, will you go with this man? I will go, she said. An obvious invitation to Rebecca to go with the servant and ultimately marry the son. Can I just be real? I'll start now. Most people don't invite others to follow Jesus. They're afraid to. They're afraid of the rejection. But we are just servants of Christ, church. We are image bearers who testify to God's grace in our lives, and we invite people to know Jesus. Here's my favorite question that I've asked others for decades. What is stopping you from following Jesus? And I don't know everybody in this room. I know a lot of you. And so maybe I don't know you that well. And maybe you're someone who isn't following Jesus. What's stopping you from following Jesus? Tell somebody. Tell me. The fact is that many don't have a reason other than pride or fear. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't ask people. So I'll ask you, Church of the Valley, what's stopping you from following Jesus? And for some of us, we might say, I am following Jesus. I attend this church. I was baptized. I'm nice to my neighbors. <laughs> Congrats. <laughs> and again, I would tell you that, that is only, it is only by identifying with Christ and his finished work that any of us are made right before God. But those of us who have received his grace, we have been called to a lifelong pursuit of Christ's likeness through being in his word, through being in prayer, through being in community, and none of those things justify us. 
They are all gifts given with the invitation to follow Jesus Christ daily together. So Rebecca is invited to go with the servant to meet and marry the son. Worship team, come on up. Let's conclude this passage today with what happens. Verse 62. Now Isaac had come from Bir Lahai Roy. I liked how Mike said it better. For he was living in Najif. He went out to the field one evening to meditate. And as he looked up, he saw camels approaching. Rebecca also looked up and saw Isaac. She got down from her camel and asked the servant, who is that man in the field coming to meet us? I have assumptions about tone. Who's that man? He is my master, the servant answered. So she took her veil and covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac all he had done. Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother, Sarah, and he married Rebecca. So she became his wife and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Rebecca receives the invitation to be the bride of Isaac. They meet, they marry, he loves her. Church, this is what happens to any and all of us when we bow a knee and we trust that Jesus is who he says that he is. That he is the way, the truth, and the life. We don't just believe in convenience. We don't have a marriage of convenience. Rather, we have a lifelong commitment and life-transforming decision that if we understand the severity of our sin or not, have had God in his goodness and his grace reach down into our lives and rescue us from the wages of sin and pay for our sins with his own life. Let's pray. Father, I praise you for your truth. And I ask God as we sing about the reality that you come and you rescue. I pray, God, that we would be overwhelmed with how much you love us. We'd be overwhelmed with how much you care for us. We'd be overwhelmed with the gifts that you've given us that maybe we haven't even noticed yet. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your son. Thank you for community. Thank you for the truth of your gospel. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.